look at economic theory and what kind of recommendations uh, typically you see in the theory with respect on how to foster innovation, and particularly with respect to the role of competition, you had traditionally two schools of thought. One that I would characterize as the conventional wisdom, the neoclassical approach, that basically suggests that competition, for instance, trade liberalization, is going over the long term to lead to productivity growth and innovation. Then there is another school of thought associated, for instance, with infant industry types of experiment, but that can be rationalized in the so-called Schumpeterian model that points out that the innovation needs rents. Too much competition actually can be bad for you from the perspective of innovation. Now, in this book that I mentioned to you, uh, we did some analysis trying to explore what is called the new Schumpeterian model, which is some attempts to understand how the process of competition and innovation interact. This is based on the work of Felipe Aguillon and others. And what we did in this book was exactly to look over a period of time from uh, the 1980s to uh, the early 2000s to a series of countries in terms of their trade liberalization processes. We used tariffs simply because this was the only indicator that we could use for a long period of time. But it's important to keep in mind that tariffs are just one element of the situation in terms of the trade regime of a country. If you look at Malaysia, for instance, Malaysia has a very open trade regime as far as tariffs are concerned. But if we use other type of analysis, like, for instance, what is called the overall trade restrictiveness index that tries to combine not only tariffs but non-tariff measures, you can see that Malaysia still has a significant level of protection. So how you administer this process over time is something that has uh, merits lots of attention. So we looked at a whole array of countries in terms of those types of uh, uh, aspects that I already pointed out, be it the level of competition, be it access to information, for instance, uh, through openness, through uh, foreign direct investment and technological licensing, also the kind of interaction between universities and the private sector, and skills, particularly in science and technology, and particularly, for instance, the body of human capital in research and development in science and technology in the different economies. And you have these numbers. You can easily uh, position Malaysia, Thailand uh, as well, using as counterparts Brazil, India, and China, and having Korea as, quote, unquote, the frontier. Same thing with respect to finance. So what we try to look is to what extent, what happened when countries liberalized their trade regimes, and what was the implication for innovation, having full uh, understanding that this is just one dimension of the process. So in countries like Brazil, where macroeconomic instability was very high in the 1980s, you had other types of problems that independently of the trade regime dominated, let's say, the market signals. But what we were looking is to what extent these countries had put in place what we are characterizing as distance shortening policies. Distance shortening in the sense that are activities that try to support innovation, not necessarily industry champions, not necessarily a sector, it may well be research and development in general, be it through the fiscal system, <laughs> be it through the educational system, university, industry cooperation, and how, for instance, and this study was specifically comparing Korea, 
as the frontier for the study with China, Brazil, and India. And the bottom line, the message that comes out from this study is that through very different type of policy instruments, but China has more or less been able to pursue the Korean path of growing investment in innovation and sustained productivity growth, while Brazil and India had much greater challenges in pursuing this, in part because of the inheritance of the import substitution industrialization model, in part because of macroeconomic problems, regulatory problems. But what the analysis shows is that if we look industry by industry, again, we take the distance to the frontier as the difference in productivity levels between Korea and the same industry in Brazil, in China, and in India. We can show that, yes, as conventional wisdom suggests, competition helps innovation. More competition will create incentives for more innovation. But distance to the frontier matters. So there is a tipping point. If you are close to the frontier in terms of your productivity levels at the start of the process of liberalization, when you liberalize, this is going to stimulate even more investment in innovation. If you are very far from the frontier, then the result may be negative. So that's why sequencing and distance shortening type of support by the government makes sense. But how to do this, particularly in a world with multilateral disciplines, is something that requires careful analysis. So this is just, uh, and you can see later uh, in the book, how, for instance, the evolution over time of these different countries in terms of the frontier, again, the as the productivity in the Korean manufacturing sector uh, evolved over time. Brazil and India had a much less dynamic process, although now over the last uh, 10 years or so, Brazil is catching up, and China has significantly overtaken uh, India, and to a certain extent is at levels of productivity uh, similar to the ones that Brazil had achieved. Now, just just to conclude, if there is one thing that uh, is really interesting when we put this analysis in the context of the situation of Malaysia and other countries in East Asia, a big difference that comes is the level of R&D intensity of the Malaysia and the Thai economy for that matter, vis-a-vis -vis other economies in similar brackets of income per capita. As you can see, Korea, that I already mentioned, uh, has come in the 1980s from a level of R&D intensity of something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 percentage points of GDP to nowadays being around 3, 4 percent of GDP and is really one of the champions in OECD uh, in terms of R&D intensity. And did this transformation in just 30 years. And even more interesting is how the financing uh, of R&D in the case of Korea evolved. In the 1980s, 80% of the R&D financing and the execution was by the public sector and only 20% by the private sector. Nowadays is the, exactly the opposite. So they did this shift in one generation. And this is something to keep in mind when we look at the experience of other countries. China seems to be repeating this kind of trajectory that I just mentioned with respect to Korea. In the case of Brazil, also now has levels of R&D intensity above one percentage point, but it's still very unstable. Now, Malaysia and Thailand, as I already mentioned, and here are some numbers, uh, show much 
lower levels of L&D intensity than the other comparators that we have in this analysis. What is also interesting to keep in mind is that if we look, for instance, in terms of uh, the growth in R&D over the last few years, you're going to see that Malaysia in reality, and uh, some of these slides, let me just clarify this, you don't have in your version because Philip Shalikens was going to make a presentation on Malaysia, but uh, he was not able to join us uh, because of a health issue in the family. So I just added a few slides on Malaysia and uh, I'm sure the organizers will distribute later these additional slides. But the point that this slide makes is that in terms of R&D spending uh, as a proportion of GDP, both Malaysia and Thailand are in reality not catching up, are falling behind because the level of intensity of the comparators is increasing. The situation in Thailand is even more dramatic if we look also in terms of the question of number of professionals working on R&D, and the same thing for Malaysia. Now, it's true that Malaysia, in terms of growth rates in R&D, has significantly increased in the last few years. So, it's probably now on a trajectory of catching up, but it still has a major, major hurdle ahead of it in terms, for instance, of the number of scientists and engineers that are available for working in innovative activities. So this is something to keep in mind. Other aspects that are interesting to look at is, for instance, the, if you ask the private sector in terms of the source of innovation, one thing that uh, you can see that uh, fares relatively low in terms of uh, uh, the answers from Malaysian companies is the question of uh, cooperation between universities and the private sector. It's also the question of technological licensing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, multinational corporations. So these are areas that require special attention. If we look, for instance, trends in patent citations, uh, both Malaysia and Thailand have a very low level of own citation, meaning using knowledge that is locally generated, but also even with respect to the region, meaning East Asia as a whole. Now, if we look at countries like uh, Taiwan, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, Korea, you see the dramatic evolution in terms of own citation and also the clustering of economic activity and knowledge diffusion in the region. Actually, if we control by the body of knowledge, if we control by frequencies of patent citation, you can see that Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Korea have significantly increased in relative terms, although most of the knowledge is still coming from the usual suspects, uh, vis uh, be it the United States, Japan, or the European Union. You can see that uh, once you control by the size of knowledge, there is an increasing reliance on East Asian trends. So, the case of Malaysia, just to finalize, and I understand that uh, the NEM is paying special attention to these questions of productivity. One of the challenges is exactly the recognition that productivity uh, growth has been relatively slow, and in this sense, total factor productivity, if we compare, uh, has been below what could be uh, dreamed of in terms of potential for Malaysia. It's quite true, you are all uh, very familiar with this story, that Malaysia has one of the most technology-intensive export bundles in the world. But 
This does not necessarily mean that there is a, a very high level of value added, uh, value addition in the context of Malaysia because of the high import content of these exports. So this is something that in terms of how Malaysia is going to look forward in terms of increasing its R&D intensity, increasing the clustering and particularly the uh, potential to explore value-added exports, high value-added exports, is, so these are areas from the point of view of policy that are particularly important.